Hello and welcome to my blog on insulin, salt and fat traps. So let's begin by talking a little bit about hormones, insulin and insulin resistance. Certain hormones, which are chemical messengers in the body, particularly insulin and thyroid hormone, decide what your body does with the energy it has. Energy is the food we eat or the energy stores we have, which would be fat or muscle or glycogen in the liver and muscles. Research is starting to show that when people suffer from weight issues, there appears to be some sort of hormone imbalance involved, and human obesity is just a bit more than calories in versus calories out, although ultimately it does boil down to that. Now insulin is a small protein hormone, and it's secreted by the beta cells in the pancreas. Its main job is to clear glucose from the blood and usher it into cells, particularly muscle and fat cells, as blood sugar levels in the body need to be tightly regulated. Insulin tells the body to store energy, while glucagon, another hormone which opposes insulin, helps to mobilise energy and helps release fat from cells in a process called lipolysis. This fat that's released from cells can then be used as energy in a process called beta-oxidation, which happens in the mitochondria. Insulin is also a potent growth factor, which is a both a good and a bad thing. So to sum up for now, insulin is a storage hormone and growth factor. It's only a problem when there's too much or too little insulin. Now insulin is supposed to be released in a pulse when we eat and then drop back down to a normal level. We don't want insulin to be elevated or high all the time, as this will cause fat and protein to be locked away, making them unavailable to the cells that need them. Also, it makes the body think that carbohydrate is the only fuel it can use, which will then, of course, cause sugar and refined carb cravings, which then spiral into a pattern of overeating. Chronically high insulin is also inflammatory, which causes a whole host of health issues from acne, pain, fertility issues, cardiovascular disease, and of course type 2 diabetes. Every cell in the body has insulin receptors, and this is where the insulin binds and gives the cell instructions on what to do. This means that insulin affects nerves, blood cells, bones, and pretty much every other cell in the body. The common effect is that insulin promotes cell growth, and this can be a problem when insulin levels become too high or some cells become insulin resistant. Problems with insulin and other hormones can be due to the receptor, as in there's plenty of the hormone around, but there's something wrong with the, the receptor where it's supposed to bind or the cell membrane where the receptor is. So this means even though there's plenty of hormone around, for whatever reason, the cell is ignoring the hormone and this is called in, a, in this case insulin resistance. So some factors which increase insulin levels and insulin resistance include eating a lot of carbohydrates particularly sugar and refined starches and also eating them very frequently, low salt which we'll talk about later, chronically high cortisol which is a stress hormone, abdominal fat, so that's the fat around uh, the organs, not the fat under the skin, low thyroid hormone, low lean muscle mass, a bad night's sleep, some genes predispose people to type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. There are certain medications and an example would be growth hormone and the antipsychotic olanzapine and also too much oxalic acid which is found in the leaves of certain plants, particularly rhubarb leaves, but also things like kale and spinach. We'll come back to oxalic acid in a different blog. Because pretty much all cells are affected by insulin or insulin resistance or diabetes, we can get numerous conditions associated with too much insulin or cells not responding to insulin. And also it's really important to emphasize that these conditions are not a consequence of glucose alone. They appear before glucose or blood sugar levels change. So this means insulin is driving the pathologies, not just glucose. So you can have normal blood sugar levels, but still have abnormal insulin levels. So this is why type 2 diabetes can develop silently over decades. And this is in part because we're chasing the wrong biological marker, as in testing blood sugar, not uh, blood insulin. And also giving type 2 diabetics more insulin when they already have too much because this can increase the risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease and other complications. So basically 
patients sh who have issues with blood sugar or think they might do should have their insulin levels tested rather than just blood glucose. So what are some do it at home steps that you can do to manage your insulin sensitivity or your insulin levels? Well first of all uh, as doctors are not taught to measure insulin levels the tests can be hard to obtain. However you can measure your ketone levels because ketone levels are inversely proportional to insulin so if ketones are high insulin must be low unless you're drinking lots of exogenous ketones like MCT oil or uh, beta hydroxybutyrate. So for insulin levels to be low you don't have to be in nutritional ketosis as in on a full keto diet because the reading of ketones on that style of diet is usually around 0.3 to 0.5 millimole per litre. A reading of 0.1 millimole per litre is fine for insulin control. Now one of my favourite scientists, Dr Benjamin Bickman, who has a PhD in bioenergetics and would say he's an insulin guy, he has a three-step diet tip for managing insulin, which is control the carbs, prioritise proteins, and fill with fats. Number three just means uh, fill up the rest of your calorie requirements with healthy fats. I would also personally include get rid of sugar rather than just controlling the carbs, particularly if you're new to a low carb diet or already insulin resistant or type 2 diabetic. There's basically no nutrients in sugar. The types of foods in are mainly junk foods. It's addictive and also it can deplete your body of certain minerals. You might feel a bit crap for a few days while your metabolism adjusts and you become fat adapted, but it'll be worth it in the end. So back to carb diets or low carb or keto diets. Some people, like everything, take it to the extreme and try and limit protein too much as well as cutting out the carbs. So they pretty much live on fat. And the theory behind this is because under some circumstances protein can spike in insulin because the amino acids in protein can be made into glucose in the liver by a process called gluconeogenesis. But there are still cells in the body that need glucose and you wouldn't really be able to do a low-carb diet without gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis is not a bad thing. Also, in people who are fat adapted, as in their bodies have got used to burning fat as a fuel, studies found that proteins caused a much lower insulin spike than in people who were carb burners, as in they Still on the subject of diet, fasting and intermittent fasting, if done properly, are great ways to manage insulin levels because when there's no food around it pushes the body out of energy storage mode and into energy usage mode. So remember, energy storage is insulin high, energy usage would be hormones like glucagon high. So again, over time this will help to improve your insulin sensitivity or get rid of your insulin resistance. Exercise is key too for managing insulin sensitivity because first of all it expends energy. Secondly, under situations where you exercise heavily you can put yourself into ketosis where your body's burning its own fat producing ketones and as I said before when ketones are high uh, insulin is going to be low. Also certain types of exercise that are weight bearing done at the right loads etc will develop muscle mass and this will act as a sink for glucose because glucose can be stored in the muscles as glycogen. So with respect to exercise and eating carbs I would just generally say exercise first as in you could do some fasted cardio in the morning and then refuel second as in uh, have your food after you've trained particularly if you're trying to manage your insulin levels or lose fat a phrase which uh, the late Charles Poliquin said, he said that you need to earn your carbs. So let's dive into the importance of salt because this is sometimes the area which people uh, miss out on and this was the missing piece of the jigsaw for me. So under normal circumstances you need about three to five grams of salt per day. When you restrict salt your body's biochemistry begins to panic. And one way to rescue this situation is to raise insulin levels. So obviously that's not a good thing if you're trying to manage insulin, lose weight, or you're already insulin resistant. This is because when insulin levels are high, salt is retained in the kidneys. So on the other side of the coin, when you lower insulin, 
either by cutting carbs, fasting, more salt is excreted by the kidneys. And also, if you drop too low in salt, either by sweating it out or just not eating enough in general, this causes your body to release stress hormones to retain the salt, which they also raise insulin. And again, insulin's job is to lower blood sugar, so you're more likely to get sugar cravings or carb cravings. To make this even worse, low salt or low sodium also triggers the dopamine centers in your brain, which is the reward center, which means cravings for sugar and other pleasurable substances increase. So back to the keto diet, or if you exercise heavily, you might need about one to two extra grams of salt per day. Also, if you drink a lot of coffee and energy drinks, um, or use a sauna often, then your uh, demand for sodium is going to increase. And saunas are great, by the way. They have many health benefits, but just remember you are sweating out salts and minerals and such like. Another interesting thing about restricting salt, usually to about less than two grams a day, is it causes the artery stiffening hormones such as renin, angiotensin 2, aldosterone to raise. And ironically, these are the targets for blood pressure lowering medications. And as I said before, this also activates uh, stress hormones, which are noradrenaline and adrenaline. So this means restricting salt can actually raise your blood pressure. And because the kidneys or the adrenal glands have to make these hormones, they can become overworked, which can lead to the uh, dreaded adrenal fatigue or adrenal insufficiency. How do we avoid eating too much salt? Well, interestingly, um, hospital admissions with salt-related problems uh, are always for people with too little sodium, uh, not too much, because um, Without getting too complicated, we have a salt regulating gauge in our bodies and um, the salt regulating gauge sends signals to the brain uh, to tell us to seek more salt when we need it to function properly and also when to stop uh, eating salt when we've had enough to function. So the kind of salt that you choose does matter. So just eating loads of crisps or salty food isn't really the solution or cheap table salt. You really want to go for the good quality uh, salt like the pure sea salt or the pink Himalayan salt. And also uh, salt contains iodine which is key for thyroid function and I mentioned earlier right at the beginning of the blog that thyroid function is very important for managing weight and also it does play a role in insulin resistance as well. So sadly we have been misinformed about salt and this white crystal is not the enemy. Now there's a really interesting book called The Salt Fix by Dr. James Nicolantonio, um, which I highly recommend. And also lots of interviews with James on uh, the dangers of low salt diets all over YouTube. So moving on from salt or sodium chloride, there are a few more nutrients and supplements which can help with insulin sensitivity. The ones which are minerals would be chromium, lithium and magnesium but these only usually help if a person is deficient in these minerals to start with. However, magnesium and other mineral deficiencies are very common nowadays. This is mainly due to the poor quality of soil that plants are grown in, which is where we get um, the majority of our minerals. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful. Remember, when you're trying to do things for yourself, it's an N equals one experiment, as in just you. And what works for one person may not necessarily work for you and vice versa. Also, there are many layers and intricacies to biochemical pathways and haven't covered everything in this blog. The take home message is that salt isn't bad. And if you're struggling with weight loss, insulin sensitivity, cravings, it could be something for you to check that you haven't checked before. So anyway, thank you very much for listening and have a great day.